Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. If you would like to support the show, head on over to audibletrial.com backslash TMP to get your free audiobook download and 30 day trial at audibletrial.com backslash TMP. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from. You can listen to them on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or your MP3 player. Make sure you sign up on the computer so that we get credit. We get a kickback for everyone who signs up for a free trial at audibletrial.com backslash TMP. You are now listening to the Mythesis Podcast, your portal to the paranormal, streaming live at mythesis.me. Your hub for all things spiritual, esoteric, and paranormal. And now, your host, Truth Seeker. Tonight, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Michael Heiser. Tonight's show is entitled, The Divine Council of the Elohim. Dealing with the scriptures and dealing with a lot of ancient holy books, we hear the, the word Elohim tossed to and fro. A lot of people have different interpretations about what that means. Tonight, we're going to go straight to the scriptures and straight to the text. Dr. Michael Heiser is a, he has a PhD in ancient Semitic languages. And we're going to be uncovering some truths tonight because many people have a lot of different things to say. There's a lot of half-truths in this field. There's a lot of partial truths. And, um, you know, I think tonight we're going, to, we're going to be getting into some deep information. And a lot of people are listening. A lot of people have questions. So we're going to be taking calls a little bit later. If you have any questions or comments for Dr. Michael Heiser, tonight is your chance to ask those questions. If you're listening via YouTube, uh, I appreciate everybody uh, holding me down over there and the show and everybody sharing it on Facebook. It means so much. You guys uh, motivate me to keep doing this. Without further ado, we're going to welcome onto the show Dr. Michael Heiser. Are you there? I'm here. Thank you. How's it going, brother? Very good. Thanks for having me on the show. Pleasure, man. I've been looking to speak with you for some time now. I've been following your work for the last couple of years and... Pretty amazed, pretty impressed with a lot of your work with breaking down the languages. You know, I can admit some of it is a little bit deep for me. Some of it is a little bit over my head, but I do understand the concepts. And tonight we want to kind of take some of the deep understandings and kind of break those down in a layman's term where someone who is just hearing these terms that we can just have a discussion where everybody can understand that. Is that fine tonight? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try not to be boring. I'll do my best. Do you get that a lot, or is that just me? <laughs> oh, you know, some of this stuff is uh, it's it's tedious. You know, it's detailed, yeah. but uh, it's it's encouraging to hear you say that the the concepts are graspable, and that's that's what we shoot for. So we'll shoot for that tonight. I think when it comes to the Bible and it comes to you know mainstream Christianity today, some of the work that you bring to the table. Is somewhat revolutionary to the mindset of of Christianity. What what types of um, feedback have you been getting from the mainstream church? I mean, do they look at you sideways? Do they look at you as a heretic? What's some of the the feedback you've been getting by presenting some of your work? Well, I actually get that whole spectrum. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, probably uh, you know the, the first time people hear this sort of thing, they look at you like you got two heads. So I'm used to that. Uh, but there will also be, you know, people that are patient and they'll follow. You know, they, they won't just sort of write you off after the first 10 minutes, you know, and they, they'll follow along. And then, you know, it becomes a lot clearer and they can see, you know, why it's important to be, you know, precise in your terminology and what's at stake and, and you know, really how it, it sort of, in a lot of ways, it doesn't change uh, familiar doctrine, but uh, it it really makes it a lot richer. There there's it brings a, a cohesion to uh, not only both testaments but things that are sort of scattered around the Old Testament that are kind of odd. But you know it it helps marry some of those things together in in a coherent way. But you know there there are some people out there that think I'm a heretic too. So we you know we have to give them give them some kudos, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're going to get you know, it. If not, if, yeah, if not on the show, they're going to get it on the message boards and the blogs and the YouTube sure. comments and well, stuff. They're, they're, they're gonna... out. They're out. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, they're defending the faith as they understand it, and so I'm yeah. I'm sympathetic mm -hmm. to that. 
but you know they they need to realize that you know you, you need to get your you need to get your theology not from the English Bible. You need you need to be able to penetrate that and look at Scripture for what it what it says and what it is, and realize that the Bible wasn't given to us in English, and there's something behind what they're looking at in the text. And it, it can be really helpful if we just uh, resist thinking of the context of the Bible as the 21st century. You know, uh, it's not if, if unless you're going back to the the context of the people who wrote it, any context you bring to it, whether it's the Reformation or the Catholic Church or evangelicalism or Protestantism, th those are all alien contexts to the Bible. Mm -hmm. They are not the biblical context. And that's the hurdle, the first hurdle that people sort yeah. of have to get over. I think that's one of the hardest ones, too, is to... Um, it is. You know, it, it's to actually read the scriptures and think that it's you know speaking about you or written for you. And not understand that that this was written to a people and for a people who lived a very long time ago, as far as the prophecies and things like that. So that's what I want to get into tonight. I guess the first place we can start off is kind of a place where a lot of people start off in this subject is dealing with the word God in the book of Genesis. What is that word? Because we hear that the word God is the word Elohim, and it's actually plural and means more than one. Can you give us a breakdown on your understanding on that, what you found? Sure. Elohim is a very common word uh, in the Hebrew Bible. It's a, it's a common noun. It, you know, it means you know, G-O-D, divine being, uh, generally. But it's used as a proper name a lot by the biblical writers, and so it becomes a specific name for the, the deity, the, the divine being, the God of Israel. Um, but it, Elohim is kind of like the word well let me let me just back up a second elohim is spelled it is shaped plural uh the fancy word for that is morphology uh words have shapes they there is a way that they are formed if i take the word uh form f o r m and i add an s to it i have changed its shape i have changed its morphology and depending on the context the word f o r m s is that a noun, like you're out on a job site pouring concrete into forms or filling out forms? Is it a noun or is it a verb? You know, some, this forms that. You don't know until you put those letters that, that make up that word, until you put that word in a sentence. You have to give it some context. And Elohim is like that. So even though it's shaped plural, uh, it can mean and often does and most often does, it, it, it actually speaks of a singular entity. It's kind of like the word deer, D-E-E-R in English. You know, if I just looked at you, Derek, and said, deer, and I said, you know, followed that with a question, am I talking about one or more than one? Uh -huh. We well, have no way to answer the question because it's just D-E-E-R. You have to, you, I'd have to put it in a sentence for you, uh -huh. and then you'd know if I, if I said, you know, the deer is in the field, you know that D-E-E-R is speaking of only one because of the verb is. Yeah, Elohim is kind of like the word deer. I mean, you have to put it into a sentence for you to know what it means. And so even though it's spelled plural, it can mean singular. And frankly, most of the time uh, that it's used in the Hebrew Bible, it refers to the singular God of Israel. Just, just in case people doubt that, any of your listeners, if they go to my uh, website, it's just drmsh.com, and then at the top they click on the link for Zechariah Sitchin. That's my sitchinisrong.com site. And once they're there, if they go to the Elohim tab, I actually have PDF files of the places where Elohim uh, is matched with a singular verb, for example, or a plural verb to show how it's distinguished. So it's not very exciting, but, you know, I want people to know I'm not making it up either. If anybody pulls out their Strong's concordance, it actually will tell you as well in there. I think, I guess what we can move on now to is the fact that once we understand that the word Elohim is a plural term or can be a plural term and a, a name as well, where does that fit into the Bible? Where, where does that fit into the context there? Yeah, every occurrence of Elohim, you have to look at, at 
its context, you know, what, what, what it tells you. And in Genesis 1, 1, for example, you know, we have Elohim, uh, the, you know, creating the heavens and the earth. You know, Bereshit, bara Elohim, and then so on and so forth. Well, the verb that it goes with, bara to create, is grammatically singular. Uh, for people who know Hebrew, it's just a cal form that's third masculine singular. Well, that tells you right away that I need to take the word Elohim in terms of a singular meaning so that so that I have subject verb agreement I mean that that's that's just the way a language works that's with my illustration with deer that's an illustration mm -hmm. of subject verb agreement the deer is in the field the deer are in the field and the the grammar that's the context uh, the, the linguistic context the grammatical context tells you how to understand the word and so in in the Hebrew Bible this isn't difficult uh, you know, there there are very few places where there could be ambiguity. You could probably count them on one hand mm -hmm. uh, with with respect to the word Elohim. So most of the time, it just point blank tells you if you uh, can get to the grammar. And people can get to the mm -hmm. grammar if they know Hebrew. And if, if they have something like uh, the company I work for, Logos, creates called a reverse interlinear or a good, a good website that has uh, morphological, grammatical information attached to each word, you'll be able to tell whether... In this case, the verb is singular or not, and then you know you know how to take Elohim. It just takes a little work. You have to kind of know what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we have Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. This is kind of a popular one, um, and it reads, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay, so like what you were saying, let us. This, this is actually meaning more than one. I know the Christian doctrine says that this is... Um, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit speaking. That's what they try to say. According to your findings, is this a you know a council of of angels who are over creating mankind, or or is this the supreme God speaking alone to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Well, I would I would opt for actually something different. <laughs> okay. You know, aside from that, let's let's just walk through the the, the verses here. And if somebody, again, is on a website where they can get to the word-level information, they can follow along here. But verse 26, we have Elohim said. Well, let's look at the word said. Is it grammatically singular or plural? It's singular, Vayomer, again, third masculine, singular. So we have the singular God saying. And then mm -hmm. here's what he says. Let us make humankind in our image. So we have a singular speaker that's the God of the Bible, the God of Israel. Singular speaker announcing to a group, hey, let's do something. Let us make humankind in our image. So he's speaking to a group, and the question is, well, who's in the group? And you're right. You know, a lot of uh, Christians will take this as a reference to the Trinity, as though God is having a conversation with uh, himself or the members of the Trinity. Uh, that is... Could, that, that could be workable here, but the problem with it is, is if you take other scenes in the Bible where God is, you know, in his heavenly throne or in some other, uh -huh. you know, his divine abode in heaven, and he's speaking to a group of Elohim, for instance, Psalm 82, you can't have the Trinity there because he's castigating the members of the heavenly host, the divine council, is the language that Psalm 82 uses. He's, you know, reaming them out for being corrupt. Well, you know, obviously that can't be a Trinitarian context unless you want really terrible Christian theology there, you know, where you have the other members of the Trinity being sentenced to death. You're going to die like men. You're corrupt. You know, you can't have that. And so, you know, you, you have this, this tension already. I think it's a lot easier, and frankly, it's in complete agreement uh, with other parallels, other parallel texts to have in Genesis 1.26, God announcing to his heavenly host that, hey, I, we're, we're going to do this. We're going to create humankind in our image. And we can talk about the image if you want. The, I, the image is not a, an attribute that we have. The image is really a status mm -hmm. or a role that we have. And we have a role uh, in, in God's plan and, and the divine beings of the heavenly host, the quote-unquote angelic beings, they have a role to play in their sphere of authority. That's why it's plural there. But you keep going through the verse, and when you get to the creation part, 
you know, let us create humankind in our image after our likeness, so on and so forth. When you get to verse 27, it says, and God, Elohim, created humankind. Well, there's another verb, created. Is it plural or singular? Again, it's a singular. So you only have one being, the creator. Okay? You only have one creator in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and that is the singular God of the Bible. And if you even go further in verse 27, so God created humankind in his image. There it's singular. Okay, or as his image and as his likeness, in his likeness, God created, again, Elohim, singular verb, bara, created he, him, male and female, so on and so forth. So you, you have really both things going on, and you have more or less have to pick your way through the two verses to get the picture. God's announcing his intent, but he's the only one that's carrying out his own intent. It's like, it'd be like if I said, I use this illustration a lot, if, I, if I'm at work and I walk into a room and I say, hey, let's get pizza. Okay, I'm, I'm the singular speaker. There's only one of me. I'm announcing it to a group. And then we all get in a car. We go down to the pizza place. But I order the pizza and I pay for it. Okay, I'm the, I'm the single actor. But then the, the crowd with me, you know, gets some benefit out of that. They, they participate, but only in sort of a peripheral, secondary way. They're, they're observing in that case. They're eating with me. But you have the same thing going on in Genesis 1, 26, and 27. So at this point, um, Genesis 126, we see God the Creator, singular. He spoke, he said, let us make man in our image. So who is the us and who is the our? Is those, are, are those what we call the Elohim? Are those the, the other gods that he set up to rule as well and to help? Yeah, I would, I would say they're, they're the other members of the heavenly entourage or the heavenly host. This, this actually really requires us to get, to, to get into the term itself, Elohim, mm -hmm. uh, so that people can, can kind of parse this. Okay, now, well, let's I go there. All right, I want, I want your, your listeners to think about this. The word Elohim, and again, if, if they go up to, to either my site, uh, www.thedivinecouncil, D-I-V-I-N-E, Council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L.com, or they can go to drmsh.com and just find the link there. If they go up there, they'll, what I'm going to say, they can read. So if anybody's taking notes or can't follow, just don't panic. So Elohim is actually used of four or five different things in the Bible. Uh, that's, just, that's, that's important point number one. The biblical writer uses the word Elohim to describe five different entities, five different things. One is the God of Israel. That's the obvious one. There, then there are the heavenly host, the members of the spiritual world, like in Psalm 82, the, the plural Elohim, other divine beings that are in you know, God's presence with him. Then you have in Deuteronomy 32, 17, you have the Shadim, and that's usually translated demons. It, it actually, it's probably closer to, to, to guardian spirits or something like that. But you have them called Elohim in that verse, Deuteronomy 32, 17. Depending on how you understand Genesis 32, the first couple verses and what event that refers back to, you could have angels referred to as Elohim. And then lastly, in 1 Samuel 28, 13, when the medium at Endor you know, is asked by Saul to bring Samuel up, and lo and behold, it actually works, she panics and says, I see an Elohim coming up out of the earth. And then Saul asks, well, what does he, so he's only referring to one being, what does he look like? And then she describes him, and, oh, yep, that's Samuel. And they have a conversation, and Samuel basically gives him a message from God that more or less says, your dynasty's done with, you're toast. So you have five different things referred to as Elohim. Now, here's the question. Would the biblical writer understand that those five different things are not equal in attributes? In other words, would the biblical writer think that the spirit of a deceased person is on the same level in terms of attributes as the God of Israel, or that angels are on the same level, or that Shadim are on the same level as the God of Israel. 
Well, it's kind of obviously no, because everywhere else in the Bible there's a clear distinction. I mean, there are things that only the only God can do, and there are things that God is that no other entity is. So that tells you that to the biblical mind, the biblical writer, Elohim did not refer to a unique set of attributes. But that's the problem, because that's exactly the way we use G-O-D. When we look at, look or write or say G-O-D, we are so used to thinking of G-O-D as a unique, singular being with attributes that no other being has. And so it's hard, it would be hard for us to use G-O-D of five different things and feel good about it because we attach attribute significance to the term. But that is not the way the biblical writer, the Hebrew Bible, uses Elohim. It does not refer to a set of attributes. What it does refer to, the reason that you have five of these things you know, spoken of with, with the same term, with Elohim, is Elohim is what I like to call a place of residence term. It doesn't tell you what a thing is. It tells you where a thing belongs or where a thing is from, where it lives, so to speak. Elohim are beings that by nature are disembodied and they inhabit this thing we call the spiritual world. That's all it means. If I want to describe a, a being that it does not you know, belong to the human realm, it's not enfleshed, okay, it's by nature disembodied. It's not human. Okay, it's, it's none of these things that we are. If I want to use a word to describe any being that fits that address, I would use Elohim. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Now, when you're in the spiritual world, if, you know, if we can imagine ourselves over there, on the other side, so to speak, in that world, there is rank, there is hierarchy, there is differentiation in attributes. That's why I like to say in the things that I've written that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is him. Okay, he is unique. He is species unique among the Elohim. Now, think about our world. We're all humans. But yet in the human world, while we are all humans, there's lots of differences between us. You know, there's, there's differences in attributes, in skill sets, you know, in, in really physical ability. We have differences all over the place uh, within the human population, but nevertheless, we are still all human. That, that term defines the realm to which we belong, the species to which we belong, and Elohim works that way. But the, again, the problem is, is we're so used to thinking uh, of, of Elohim and you know, the way we think of as geo, the way we think of God. You know, we assign a set of attributes to it, and then people freak out, you know, when I'm in, you know, in, in a church or something or on the, on the web or whatever and say, look, you know, you got to do something with this. The biblical writers using Elohim of four or five other things, you know, and yeah. they're not all the same level, the God of Israel, so, but they're all Elohim. So, you know, if, if they're patient, again, to hear out the explanation of what the term actually means, how the biblical writer actually uses it, mm -hmm. it it's comprehensible. But when, as soon as you even get to that point, it's oh, you're a polytheist, you know, you're a heretic, and blah 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah. You know, and I, I'm again, I'm I'm just used to it now, and I, you know, I, I'm just I'm tired of protecting people from their Bible. Yeah, I'm just not going to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think it's pretty. I think it's pretty plain from what you've shown. Just those couple of scriptures. I mean, we see Elohim as a divine father. We see the word used when mentioning demonic spirits in a sense devils and we see the word used when you when it's talking about spirits and we see it when it's talking about angels so just there from what you've shared i think it'd be you know pretty simple for anybody to grasp the context and not grasp the tradition and find out what it's talking about and seeing that there's a little bit more to it than just god it you know the word god is the supreme most high in every case yeah I don't, well i don't want to i don't want to sound too too harsh here, but you know, there are a lot of people who just if if they if I didn't hear this from my pastor, I didn't hear this from my pastor's pastor, my parents' pastor, or my parents or whatever. I I never heard this before. Therefore, ergo, 
uh, it must be wrong. I mean, you, you have a lot of people that that really don't want to they don't want to abandon what what this sense of security they have uh, associated with tradition. And, and I understand that, but I think you know we as as believers we we need to get to the point. And, and there is a price to pay for it. I, I can tell you firsthand, but you, you need to get to the point where you value the scripture more than your tradition. And, and that, that is a difficult thing to do because it will put you at risk of, you know, being judged or maligned or, or misunderstood or you mm-hmm. know, at best tolerated, you know, and you don't want your yeah. relationships to, to just be tolerated. I mean, you want... exactly. Want people to trust you. You want to have good friendships and things like that. And but you know, when push comes to shove, where where, where are your loyalties? Are are they are they with the text, or are they with what people say about the text? I mean, yeah. And it's not it's not like those are always in disagreement. They're not. Mm-hmm. But but there are times when there's a disconnect, and and you got to make these choices. Yeah, but it does also leave, you know, the seeker open to actually have to admit that he was wrong whenever you're oh, seeking yeah. something or, or, or whenever you have this doctrine that you you know you may have been teaching for years you may have taught many people and then you have to you know you have to humble yourself and say hey I taught many people this doctrine but I was wrong and whenever you're you know in this this seat of authority especially when dealing with uh you know people's eternal salvation it's a really touchy subject for you to say hey I was wrong you know, for you to yeah. actually have to renounce what you was teaching. So you have to be humble and you have to be a real student of the word. And not not many people are willing to do that because I guess for the most part, it's going to show that you're a human in it and that you do there make you mistakes. Know. But but whenever you pastors sit on Pastors are mortals. Look, look, what a lesson. Pastors are mortals. You know, it, it, I would hope that, that people who are in positions of authority, that their people understand mm-hmm. that, but the pastor's on on the journey too. He might be farther down the road, yeah. in in some respects. But again, they're they're just they're just people. Uh, but mm-hmm. you know, the problem is, if you've been teaching your people to put you on a pedestal, yeah. Well, then 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 you've got more invested than than let mm-hmm. let's just you know <laughs> do a, let's just back up here a little bit and correct ourselves and then we'll move yeah. on. I mean, it, that, mm-hmm. so it, it's it's kind of a vicious circle that. Yeah. You get into. I mean, I've I've had to you know tell people, hey, you know, I was wrong about this, that, and yeah. other thing. That's not a unique experience because I wasn't I wasn't born talking about the divine council. You know, when I became <laughs> a believer as a teenager, yeah. I didn't know anything about anything. I mean, I I was struggling with who Adam and Eve were. You know, it just yeah, I didn't, I didn't know anything, and and you just you kind of you go along and again, I for some reason I can't pinpoint to some great decision I made or. You know some some mountaintop experience here, but at at some point, it just became more important to me to affirm this thing that we that we say we believe is from God inspired, more than what people say about it. Mm-hmm. it, it that just clicked in my head one day, and I again I can't point to a time or place, but it it was there, that sense was just there, and I figured, hey, when when the dust clears, you know. God will still be standing, and and so will the Word, and and I, I might get beat up a little bit, but you know we'll we'll get over that hump, and you know if if God can't you know fix the situation, whatever the situation I'm in, then that doesn't say too much for His ability, does it? You know, mm-hmm. you just have to you have to trust Him with that, and but there's there is a price to pay, you know, and, and but it's it's wonderful to not have anybody own your mind, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, just, just to not be owned in that way and, and be able to, to be honest with people, whether they agree or not. When we talk about the, um, Psalm 80, 82 verse one, uh, mm-hmm. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Whenever we read that, who are these gods? What did they do? Because I've heard many different things, and and you know that's why I wanted to get you on the show. Are these the principalities that we're reading about that are over certain areas who sinned, or you know who are these gods that he's speaking of here? 
Yeah, I think the I think we get a clue in the last verse of this psalm, where the psalmist says, "Rise up, O Elohim! Rise up, O God!" And you know, judge the earth. You know, for you, you know, this is your inheritance. I mean, you're going you you're inheriting over all the nations. The nations are your possession. And I that language about again this inheritance of the nations and all that sort of thing gives us a clue as to what is going on. Okay. Because That's good. that language draws on Deuteronomy thirty two, uh, eight and nine, verses eight and nine. And if, if you're if your audience, people in your audience have never seen this verse, this is one of the key verses for understanding really the, the whole worldview of the Old Testament. And I would say also a lot of what's going on in the New Testament too. And verse eight in Deuteronomy thirty two says I'm reading from the ESV in case anybody wants to know. When the Most High, we know who that is, gave to the nations their inheritance when he divided humankind. Now, you know, when when did that happen? When did God divide up the nations? Well, that was the Tower of Babel. You know, we know the story. When he did that, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Now, a lot of English translations here will read according to the number of the sons of Israel. So there's a very clear difference here. Now, the ESV is one of the few translations. The new RSV is another one. Uh, The NLT, I think the latest version, uh, has this as well. The ESV reading comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls here read... The Bnei Ha Elohim, the sons of God. Uh, so it is the most textually up to date reading. Now you don't have to be a text critic though to know that this is the, the correct reading. If you just think about what the verse says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, He divides up human humankind. He fixes the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Why isn't it the sons of Israel? Because Israel didn't exist as a nation back at the Tower of Babel event. There was no Israel. Okay. So, again, I, I don't want to really drift. I, we can go into all the text-critical reasons why, you know, in terms of manuscript studies, why Sons of God is the best reading. But I think if you just use common sense here, you know, biblical sense, it can't be Sons of Israel because Israel didn't exist. If you go back to the Table of Nations yeah. in Genesis yeah. 10... You know, which leads up to the Tower of Babel event when the nations are listed. Israel does not occur in the Table of Nations. Why? Because it doesn't exist yet. What 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 this is describing is the Tower of Babel event when when you know God has given this commission. Here we are. We, we came out of the flood. God says, "Be fruitful and multiply, spread over the earth, and all this stuff." And so, what do they do? Well, let, let's go build a tower. You know, that'll be some gathering point and give ourselves a great reputation. And they they don't do what they're supposed to do. And so God says, okay, you know, if if we let this go, again, speaking in the plural, you know, to to the council again in Genesis 11, Mm -hmm. let let, let us go down and take a look. But then when you actually see who goes down, it's it's Yahweh. It's the God of Israel. It's a singular entity. Uh, Looking at this, it's like, okay, they're not going to obey. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to split them up. We're going to confuse the languages, divide up the nations. Now, I refer to this as the Romans 1 event of the Old Testament, where God says, look, you don't want to obey me. You don't want me to be your God. Fine. I'm going to scatter you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign each nation hmm. to another divine being, to one of the sons of God. And mm-hmm. if you go to Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20 is the parallel passage to this. If you look at the language there, it's actually sort of the flip side of the coin. Uh, Deuteronomy 4 says, Beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven when you see the sun, moon, and stars, all the host of heaven, and you be drawn away and bow down to them. He's telling, you know, Moses, and t- and through Moses, all of Israel, don't, you know, don't, don't do this. You know, don't get distracted and bow down to the sun, moon, and stars because, verse 19, These are the things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt. So it's the same language 
as Deuteronomy 32. You go back to Deuteronomy 32, 8, God divides up the nations in verse 8. In verse 9, he says, yeah, I just split everybody up according to the number of the sons of God, but the Lord's portion, my portion, is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So mm -hmm. this episode, again, what we think of as the Tower of Babel, this episode is a watershed event in the Old Testament and in biblical theology where God disinherits mm -hmm. the nations, the peoples of the earth, and says, okay, you don't want me to be your God. I'm going to put you under lesser authorities. I'm not going to relate to you personally. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to Ur, and I'm going to call this guy called Abraham or Abram, and I'm mm -hmm. going to start over. I'm going to start with one guy, and I'm going to raise up for myself a new people. And to, and to make it even more spectacular, this guy's old, and so is his wife. So I'm going to do something supernatural, something spectacular. I'm going to literally start with nothing. And I'm going to make my own people. And the rest of the Old Testament is the story of that people, Israel, against mm -hmm. the other nations. Is And Israel's mm -hmm. God, Yahweh, against the other gods. What happens and what he's referring to in Psalm 82. When, when God appoints the other nations to the sons of God, and he points the sons of God to the other nations, again, both sides of the same coin. He is still the creator. He is still the, 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 the lawgiver. He is still the Lord of, of justice. He expects that his underlings, even though they're divine beings, even though they're Elohim, they're lesser Elohim, he expects them to rule righteously according to the way their creator Okay. rules because they share his image let us create humankind in our image they're supposed to okay. do what he says in their realm of authority and from psalm 82 it's very plain that they become corrupt they do something they mismanage they abuse the situation you know personally i think in elsewhere in the old testament we have an indication that one of the things that that was offensive was the idea that they would uh, accept worship you know, from these mm -hmm. other peoples, as in the place of Yahweh. I mean, all these different things. And, and Israel was supposed to be, you know, the kingdom of priests idea, the, sort of the conduit, the, you know, the, 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 the light out there in the wilderness that would alert people, would, 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 would be some sort of teaching mechanism as mm -hmm. to who the true God was, and then, you know, a path back to him through the nation of Israel, ultimately, of course, through the Messiah. But all of this just gets just gets messed up and the nations that were given over to lesser administrators get farther away mm -hmm. from God as time goes on both because of their own you know feudal minds as Paul says and also because again they're they're manipulated by other divine beings so take all that and the answer to your question is I I do think that what we have in the New Testament language, now think about some of the terms. You use principalities and powers. You also have dominions, you have thrones, you have rulers, you have authorities. Uh, the other, another term is stoicheia, the, the elemental principles, the elements. It's, uh, yeah, it's that, that one's a little more abstract. But these terms are rulership terms. They are authority terms. They, mm -hmm. they refer in some way to... To some sort of dominion over like some a government, like like a yeah, like a governing bureaucracy structure or something or other. You know, the, it, it's kind of a mystery in in terms of New Testament theology whether you can sort of create a coherent hierarchy out of the New Testament terms. There's actually a lot of debate on that. It, personally, I don't I don't think you can clearly do that. I think you can get some that are more you know, above others, and but I don't, I don't think you can get a whole hierarchy out of it. But I think Paul's mm -hmm. point in using language like that is, is to, you know, stick a bug in our ear for this whole sort of setup in the Old Testament, where the nations, those who are not believers, those who are not Yahweh's people, are under the dominion of something else. Mm -hmm. That is the story of the Old Testament. God gives them up, but, but he doesn't give them up permanently. He doesn't just abandon them forever. Even the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, when God does go to Abraham, he says, look, I'm going to make you a great nation and, you know, multiply you, blah, 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 blah. And he says, you know, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. 
through you, all nations, all families of the earth will be blessed. Okay, I mean, he, he doesn't completely write them off. But the key to all this, again, is to, is to come back through Israel to, the, to relate to God the way he wants to be related to. You know, to become uh, you know, uh, part of the people of God. To, you, know, you look at what Paul does, like in Galatians. Paul says in, in Galatians 3... You know, he really, really goes after the Galatians for this. He says, mm-hmm. "Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified, and he's having begun in the spirit, are you now perfected by the flesh, and so on and so forth." And he goes, "Look, what are you doing? How in the world can you believe the gospel and then want to go back?" Okay and put yourself under the dominion of the things that you just broke a relationship with. Mm-hmm. Again, Paul uses all this, this sort of dominion relational language when he talks about the gospel, because the, the fundamental issue is which God are you loyal to? Where mm-hmm. is your faith? Who do you follow? Where is your allegiance? You know, we can we can talk about nitty gritty theological questions, and I'm I'm concerned about those. Paul says, but here's mm-hmm. the fundamental issue: Who are you in allegiance to? And that's very Old Testament in 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 its thought processes because of this whole event. You know, with Deuteronomy 32, mm-hmm. Psalm 82, all this stuff. Yeah. Well. Before we go any further, I want to address the scripture just a little bit deeper so we can kind of paint a picture before we move a little bit further about these principalities and some of the things that they've done and some of the things that they're doing uh, even to this day. First of all, I want to say, I guess, basically thank you because the way you broke that down was just so simple, precise, where anybody can understand that. And if you're lost at this point, uh, you know, I encourage you to rewind the uh, episode and uh, listen to it again because if you follow it along with the scriptures, you will see uh, the picture that he's painting is right there in front of you, but for some reason over the years, you know, it's just been kind of hidden from people because I don't know if it's the church has certain doctrines that they want to keep away from people or what, but it's right there, so it's it's very beautiful. But Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 9, as we move a little bit further, because I've heard the terms in the past and I've, I've done some research on it, I guess I want to ask your validity on this. We see here in, in verse 8, Deuteronomy 32, 8, when the mm-hmm. Most High divided to the nations. We see the Most High, and this same terminology is mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. And then we go to Deuteronomy 32, 9, for the Lord's portion, L-O-R-D-S, capital. Are these separate entities when we're speaking of Lord God, God, Most High? Are these different gods that we're speaking of, or is this different titles for the one true God? Mm-hmm. Well, the Most High is Hebrew Elyon. Uh, that that does not occur in the creation passage. That's Elohim. Uh, in fact, the the earliest reference to Elyon is in Genesis 14, when Abraham is with Melchizedek, priest. You know, mm-hmm. he's the priest of the Most High God. It's the same same terminology there, Elyon. Yeah, in, in in academic scholarship, there's a there's a big debate. You know, over is this language indicative of, of there's a most high deity, El Yon, and then sort of Yahweh is, is sort of a, a, an inferior or sub, sub-deity, where it's El Yon dividing up the nations, and then Yahweh gets a piece along with the other sons of God. Now, Deuteronomy mm-hmm. 32, 8, on, on the surface, can sound like that. Okay, if you if you view it in isolation, you could mm-hmm. argue that position. The problem is, is when you go over to Deuteronomy four, again the parallel passage, you don't have El Yon, again dispensing the nations to the sons of God, one of whom is Yahweh. You only have Yahweh there, and specifically, if you go back to Deuteronomy four nineteen, he says these are the things that. Yahweh, your God, Yahweh Elohim, the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples. There you have Yahweh doing the dispensing. And in verse 20, the Lord, Yahweh, has taken you and brought you out of the iron. In other words, the the clear actor, the clear dispenser in the passage 
in Deuteronomy 4 is the God of Israel, is Yahweh the God of Israel. So Deuteronomy 32, you, you could, again, if you just isolate it, you could think, well, that, you know, we have a Yahweh as sort of a, a, an inferior there among others. You can't get that in Deuteronomy 4 at all. So let's go back to Deuteronomy 32. And this, this gets a little hairy, again, for, for the sake of the audience. But in Semitic scholarship, if you go to the two prior verses, Deuteronomy 32, 6 and 7, you have some phrases there used of the Canaanite high god, okay, El is the, the, the high god of Canaan, that are used of Yahweh. And so there are other scholars who would say, no, we don't have two separate deities here, one that's most high that occupies the top position, and then, and then Yahweh's underneath him. Because if you go back to verses 6 and 7, Yahweh is used in verse 6, and then he's described in ways that the Canaanite high god is. And so that would argue that Yahweh is viewed here in Deuteronomy 32 as the high God. And so most high is just a title for Yahweh in these verses. If you keep going in Deuteronomy 32, uh, you don't have any reference to, again, uh, the most high. You, you have consistent references to Yahweh. So it's getting a, a little esoteric, mm -hmm. but... You know, your your audience, you know, should know that this discussion does occur among scholars. I don't believe that we have two distinct separate deities here uh, mm -hmm. or in Psalm 82, because some will try to take this argument from Deuteronomy 32 and then import it into uh, uh, Psalm 82. If you have somebody out mm -hmm. in your audience that really is into this and wants to, to really get into the details of it, uh, again, if people go up to my website, just drmsh.com, and then click on the link to my biblical studies blog, it's called The Naked Bible, or you could go to nakedbibleblog.com. When you're on that site, the Naked Bible site, I have a link on that site to this discussion. Uh, it'll just say something like Divine Counsel uh, or Psalm 82. Let me just take a quick look at it so I don't want to mislead anybody here. You go to Naked Bible, there's a tab that says uh, Divine Counsel. And if you click on that, there's a whole list of posts that I've done on this and also some papers that I've given at uh, academic conferences that go into excruciating detail. It, it'll, it'll probably be overkill for a lot of people, but just in case there's that one person out there that just loves the gory details, that's where you'll get them. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of different aspects that we can approach this from, and I think you've painted an awesome picture. When we get back to Psalm 82, uh, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Okay, then we go down and we see, uh, we can go to verse 6. It says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High God, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Can you give us a little bit of you know detail on that? Is this talk? I guess when it mentions princes, is this talking about some you know maybe some former principalities, or or is this talking about men? That that's really that, that's really an, an interesting term. Um, you know, verse six. You know, I, you are you are Elohim. You plural again. It's a plural pronoun. Our Elohim. So it, that harkens back to verse one, the plural Elohim in the count. Mm -hmm. Sons of the Most High, again, picks up, you know, harkens back to the ear uh, of Deuteronomy 32, just like the end of the verse does, so that the context is clear. There's a link here between the two. And then you get to this, nevertheless, like like Adam, you shall mm -hmm. die. Uh, again, there's a number, number of ways you can go with that. You could say it refers to humankind generally. Mm -hmm. uh, some would, would wonder, does it refer to Adam? Yeah. Uh, because it's... Um, uh, e both of those though, would speak to humanity uh, either way and then you get this fall like any prince and the prince is the more uh, interesting term here we have uh, the, it's a generic term sar it's plural here sarim prince and it's used widely uh, through the Hebrew Bible for human princes and that would make sense because if we're looking at it in terms of now catch the term if we're looking at the two lines of verse 7 as being in synonymous parallelism, 
that the first line says one thing and the second line says the same thing in a slightly different way, then you would say, oh, well, the princes are, are, are human here. But Sar is also used, like in Daniel 10, uh, of the, again, using a New Testament term here, that the principalities, the, the divine beings that are set over the nations. Mm-hmm. Now, and that makes it a little interesting because then you would have sort of an, an antithesis between the two lines. The other thing is, and again, this gets a little nitty gritty here, the, 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 the term itself, we assume it's from the noun sar, and then we have a plural sarim. It might be the case that instead of the noun sar here, we actually have a, a different root uh, that means in, in, in certain Canaanite dialects to shine. And you could actually have here fall like the shining ones or mm-hmm. uh, something like that. Uh, again, it, that would speak, you know, again to to divine beings. I I don't think it's it's clear. What I do think is clear, though, is that the the Elohim, the plural, plural Elohim here, are put under the sentence of losing their immortality. Uh, they have contingent immortality, just like human beings. You know, the the, the our human spirits, if you want to use that terminology. Mm-hmm. You know, we. We have contingent immortality. And what, what that means is that we will, you know, live forever, for, forever. Excuse me, uh, unless God decides otherwise. In other words, we don't we don't have that attribute uh, in and of ourselves. It's not ours to control. It's contingent on the the goodness and the will of God. If God mm-hmm. decides that I'm, I'm I'm doing away with that and with you, then well, then that that's what's going to happen. So the the Elohim here, there's going to come a point where their immortality is stripped from them. I, I take this as a reference uh, to a time future. I take this as eschatological because the final re-inheritance or the re- reclamation of the nations is only going to happen at the day of the Lord, uh, again, mm-hmm. at the time future. So I, I think they're connected here. Okay. But I, I, I will say that, that you could argue uh, for divine beings here, it, it, if I'm probably 60-40 in favor of the human interpretation, but but there's Uh enough here that that makes me wonder um, whether there might be something else going on, or uh, we might have a case of double entendre here, because that does happen in the Bible like any other literature. Okay. So if we look at this in a proper biblical timeline, in the term you just mentioned, the day of the Lord, that's referring to the, the second coming of Christ when he comes back to set up his dominion and to inherit all the nations. Then we have, but I said, you are gods and you, sh- you are all children of the Most High, but you shall die like men. Um, this is an event that's going to take place when Christ comes back, when he comes to dis- to you know destroy the- these gods and basically knock them off their pedestal and set up his kingdom, so that these other gods aren't getting worship anymore. This isn't something that already happened, correct? This is something that's coming when Christ comes back. Is that correct? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I would, I would say that's correct, and that that really feeds into New Testament theology because mm-hmm. there are a number of things that that Jesus does and he says, and and even more importantly, where he's at when he does or says them, that harken back. Uh, to what's going on here. Let me let me just give you one example. In, in uh, Luke, the first time that Jesus sends out uh, disciples, now he's you know he's he's sort of operated anonymously, and then there are a few events that that change that where he begins uh, sort of the public proclamation that the kingdom of God is here, and and the kingdom only does not only refer to a future earthly kingdom there. There is a, a spiritual kingdom as well that, that they both operate. They're both just as real as the other one, and they operate in tandem. So that the kingdom of God is inaugurated. It's begun at Jesus' first coming, his first advent. And when he starts announcing that, it's it's in conjunction with, believe it or not, uh, exorcisms, okay, de- conversations and defeats of, of demonic entities. And one of the things that he does, the first time he sends out disciples, how many does he send out? He sends out 70. Okay? Okay. And 
70 or 72, you have, and there, I don't want to get too far into why there's mm-hmm. an issue there, but 70 or 72, it, it's tied to the way you would count uh, the nations back in Genesis 10. Hmm. You count the nations there, you, you have 70. And so when, when Jesus says, look, I'm going to give you power over these spiritual beings, you're going to be able to cast them out. You're going to be able to, to exert power over them. And I'm going to send you out two by two, and there are 70 of you. That telegraphs that the time to reclaim the nations, the world, every nation, you know, out of every nation, you know, God wants to own every nation. Out of every nation, there's going to be people of God. You know, Jew and Gentile distinction is going to be erased real shortly here after the crucifixion. But he sends out 70, and so it's a, it's a signal for those who are sort of in tune in terms of biblical theology that this is the beginning of of reclaiming, re-inheriting the nations. And it's linked to the person of Christ. It's linked to what he's here to do. And so, again, that that it, it starts there, but it's going to have its ultimate eschatological fulfillment when the Lord does return. And as the book of Revelation says, you know, speaking to believers, he that overcomes, I will put over the nations. Okay, believers... Mm-hmm. We can, we can go so many places with this conversation here. Yeah, <laughs> it's so it's so um, it's so you know, like you said, it's it's esoteric, it's complex, it's beautiful, it's so, it's so much more than what we've been taught. You know. Well, why do we? Why but do it's we truth think because that, it's right there John, in front of us. I know. John says, "Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God." And then he adds, "And that's what we are." In First mm-hmm. John three. Why does Paul use adoption language, That's adopting crazy. us into the family of God? Why does, he, why does he refer to us as sons and daughters of God? Why does he use family yeah. language? I mean, all this stuff going on, why is it that John in Revelation says, look, to him that overcomes, I will put you over the nations. It's mm-hmm. because we, believers, the people of God, the sons of God, we, when we are glorified and exalted, we are going to displace and replace mm-hmm. the the fallen, the corrupt yeah. beings that are currently over the nations. We are the reconstituted council of God. You go to Hebrews too. Jesus, you know, th- this is this is one of the, you know, the. the there are some passages that, that you know I personally just get emotional about, and this is one of them in Hebrews two, where where mm-hmm. they're in the throne. Jesus is in the throne room of God, and he's announcing, you know, bef- he he's he's telling the congregation, the council, you know, these are my brothers. He's referring to believers as his brothers in front of the divine council. In front of the congregation, they are mine. I am. I, I, I'm their brother. They're your family. Okay. All this language, you know, Saint Hebrews one and two. To to which of the angels did God say all this wonderful stuff? Well, the answer is He didn't say it to any of them. He said it about Jesus, and He said it about us. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, you just go through the New Testament with the Old Testament in your head. <laughs> Yeah. And it, it it's just so dramatic in places what what is being said if if it if it just has a context. And again, our problem is, you know, we're we're living two thousand years after the fact or or yeah. you know, how many times do you hear the Old Testament preached? You know, it just we just don't get uh a lot of this in our heads to, to sort of filter the New Testament through the old. You know, we're filtering the New Testament through something else. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing, man. Um, so that's, you know, being transformed in the twinkling of an eye and and, and becoming as the angels. That's when Christ comes back. We're going to take their place and we're going to, you know, we're going to dethrone them, man. That's You've heard it preached in church or you heard it mentioned in church. But to actually have the breakdown and go through and say, this isn't just a little piece of it. This is what the whole Old Testament is founding on. These ancient gods who, you know, were set up and have taken the praise and taken the worship unto themselves and got haughty and how they're still there, they still want the worship, they still are receiving it from people and they still want to deceive, but there's coming a time where we're going to overthrow them, those who are in Christ, correct? Yeah, I mean, you, again, Hebrews 2, you know, that 
the, the, the whole line about we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the mm-hmm. angels. The, the Hebrew text has, actually has a little lower than the Elohim in Psalm 8. Is now crowned with glory because he suffered death, you know, the crucifixion, you know, so that by God's grace he would experience death on behalf of everybody. And then, he, then you know, you get a few verses later, the, it's all about bringing many sons to glory. You know, mm-hmm. I will proclaim your name to my brothers in the midst of the assembly, midst of the council, midst of the congregation, I will praise you. I mean, just all this stuff, you know, Jesus says, here I am with the children God has given me. Uh, it, this is what it's about. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how else you, you, know, you just say it. I mean, you, the Old Testament is is an epic drama. Now, there, there's a lot that that's on the periphery about. We sort of get sidebars like, oh, well, there's a bunch of laws about how the, the people of God should live, and there's this episode with the monarchy over here. And but the the, the core idea is this conflict between Yahweh and the other gods and Yahweh's people and those who are owned, those who are disinherited and need to come back again to to the true God. It's an epic drama that gets played out all the way up to and through uh, the the, the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And these other gods, the way that they're worshipped, they're usually not worshipped, you know what I'm saying, directly. They're usually worshipped through something tangible on the earth whether it's an idol or a rock or you know a you know some type of wooden cross or something like that some type of imagery that they portray through you know they usually don't go through and and see people you know actually bowing down to Baal but they're they're actually bowing down to the images and the stars and the things that represent these gods yeah the, there there's a certain logic that that goes with idolatry that is really telling uh, in, in in relation again to the, the contrast between other Elohim and the God of Israel, the, the the logic of idolatry was again ancient people are not idiots. They they know that that okay I'm going to make this thing I'm going to make this statue. They know that that is not a deity. That's not a divine being who who created them or, or any of this kind of thing. They like if if they if they knocked it over and it broke, they don't think their god died. They would just go make another one. Okay? Mm-hmm. So we actually have texts like this in you know in the ancient world where a, a deity, a god, an idol is destroyed in battle. So they just go home and make another one. Now, they're not idiots. What was an idol for? An idol was you would fashion this thing and then you would go through a ritual to make it habitable or to, to animate it, to, to, to make it a thing, a, a place where the deity would come and inhabit it. And so why would you do that? You are trying to localize the deity. You are trying to bring it to you so mm-hmm. that you can, you can relate to it in some way. You can bargain with it. You can cajole it. Oh, look at all these nice offerings we're giving you. By the way, can you do this, that, or the other thing for us? Can you curse our enemies and all this kind of stuff? You, mm-hmm. you localize the deity so that you can have some sort of relationship and, and in some sense hope to butter it up so that it works for you or that you get knowledge from it from the other side. This is part of the reason why in, in biblical theology and Israelite thinking, you do not make a graven image of Yahweh. Not only was he completely other than anything you could make an image of, Mm -hmm. but Yahweh will not be localized. You will not bring him to yourself. He does not obey your beck and call. He cannot be tamed. It's a completely different logic than than what's going on in, in the idolatrous world. And it, it again to me, it's just really telling. Uh, again, it, it's a, it's a it's a theological statement. You know, th- th- this resistance to images is a theological statement in a lot of ways. That's a lot to deal with, man. It's like I said. I you know, I guess I'm at a loss of words because it's so amazing. And I hope everybody will start reading the scriptures like this. I, I would just say, just typing in the word gods in a uh, search on a Bible search uh, software mm-hmm. and actually seeing how much, you know, it actually pops up. And it's a lot. It's not just these, <laughs> the, you know, these couple of scriptures that we dealt with. 
that, that you know that mention these guys. Now these guys were mentioned throughout the all of the scriptures, and they were battling back and forth, and a lot of things that they were coming down, and I mean there was a lot of stuff going on. It makes it that much more interesting. So when a lot of people try to downplay the scriptures or try to downplay the Bible and say it's not interesting, it's boring. This right here, it doesn't make someone question their faith. I wouldn't think. I would think it would make it would make someone. You know, be more interested in getting to the bottom of it because there's way more there, and it makes it a lot more interesting. Like there is something, you know, that that's you know been hidden for a very long time. I guess with that being said, I want to open up the phone lines because we have a few uh, callers who who have questions. But before I do that, I just want to get your your take on the Book of Enoch. Where does that fit in all this? Do you reference it, or is it? What's your take on that book? Sure. I, I I don't consider the book of Enoch canonical, but I have to confess that I don't even care about the question. <laughs> yeah. And what, I, what I mean by that is the book of Enoch uh, is, is quoted a couple times uh, fairly directly in the New Testament. It's also alluded to uh, a few dozen other times. So the, the, the New Testament writers knew Enoch, and they felt very free uh, to use material from Enoch to make their point, I- including theological points. Now, what that tells mm-hmm. me is that they they assign value to it. I mean, they they it, it's a book that if if the New Testament writer assigned value to it, then I think it, it's worth being familiar with. It, it's worth reading. Uh, again, it, it it needs to be part of your of your pool, uh, your knowledge pool, uh, to help you think like the writer thought. Uh, In other words, to to help you frame uh, what is being said in the New Testament, because they were very willing, again, to use that and and other things, too. So you don't have to uh, consider it canonical uh, to do that. And so in in one sense, to me, the the question, you know, should it be in the canon or shouldn't it, it it really doesn't matter. You should just read it. You should know it. You should be familiar with it. in the in there there were in the Jewish community, uh, the people who lived at Qumran uh, apparently did consider it canonical, uh, because mm-hmm. they quote they quote it like they quote uh, canonical books. You know, they, there's formulaic language like, "Thus says the Lord" or "As it is written" or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, they'll, and they'll they'll quote Enoch in that way, and a, and a few other books too. Uh, in the early church. Uh, Enoch had a couple supporters. Tertullian supported it for a while as being uh, a sacred inspired book, and Origen did. And it's kind of interesting. If, if I have a book uh, called uh, Christianity's Apocalyptic Heritage, it's a scholarly book by uh, Jim Vanderkam. And there's an interesting anecdote in there. He's talking about Origen's view of Enoch. And there's actually a, a passage where Origen is writing about this, where he, I'm going to paraphrase him, he says, well, you know, I'm I'm kind of old now, and I'm the only one still out here defending this thing. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I guess I have to I have to defer to the spirit. I have mm-hmm. to assume that the spirit has led, you know, the, the church to not recognize it, and so I'm I'm going to bail on it. You know, I'm not going to worry about it. I, I I still like it, but. I'm not going to mm-hmm. fight about it. And I, yeah, I think, it's not going to be your main battle. I hear you. Right. I, I think Origen's attitude there was is commendable. You know, I again, I, I say I don't really care about the question because I, I think we should be familiar with it and read it, if for no yeah. other reason, to help us think like they were thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great book. I, I do. We're going to open up the phone lines. Everybody who's on the line, we're going to go down the list. There's quite a few there, so if we can make it quick, we'll get through these, and okay. you guys can ask Michael uh, your questions. we got got uh, God's Warrior Princess. Who are we speaking with? I was doing very good. <laughs> How are you? Doing great. Who are we I don't, speaking I don't, with? I don't have any questions. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm just listening in, enjoying the show. Okay. Thank you. All right. You don't have any, you don't have any questions? Um. Why, uh, what's your take on on the higher selves, or or um, uh, we all have guardians um, specifically for each one of us? Yeah, I, I actually do think the uh, the idea of guardian uh, angels, that sort of thing, uh, is biblical. I mean, there's the obvious reference in at the end of Hebrews chapter one about 
angels being ministering spirits again to to serve those who inherit salvation, you know, believers, and you know, again the passage in Matthew. So I yeah I tend to think that that is a a biblical concept that um, we we have you know guardians. There there are there are beings assigned to to uh, look out you know for us in life and perhaps influence us and you know this direction or that direction. So. Yeah, I'm I'm not a I'm not a skeptic when it comes to that. Awesome. Next we have Lobito. You there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just uh, I don't really have a question right now. I'm just enjoying the show as well. All right. Well, if you if uh, something comes up, just uh, leave me a comment in the uh, chat room, and I'll bring you right in. Okay. Okay. All right, brother. Archaic Hebraic. What's going on? Hello. How's it going? Oh, good, good. Doing good. <laughs> yeah, I, I know got, you I have a question. question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I do. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Heiser, uh, sounds like you are you an atheist? No, I don't. I don't like. Uh, I don't think henotheism is an adequate term. Uh, just like I don't think monotheism is an adequate term or monolatry. I think, uh, let me, for example, henotheism, uh, the way it's it's been used in scholarship, implies, and in, in, in many cases does more than imply, that the the deity who's considered superior can be changed, can be defeated and, and displaced and replaced. I don't think an Israelite would think that at all. So, right, right. I don't, I don't, I don't like any of the terms because they're modern terms. I think, I think we're better off describing what a an Orthodox Israelite biblical writer would believe rather than trying to stick a word on it. Right now, now how would you describe their view? Because I mean, again, like with the Hanafis, and, and I know you don't like that, obviously, but they they believed in uh, other divine beings, which, by what I've read, you know, from your from your Mm-hmm. Websites mm-hmm. and stuff like that. It really kind of supports that, that view. But you know, I, I'm right there with you. I don't think. Uh, no, y'all yeah, I don't. I don't. Aside. I don't think. I don't think the recognition that there are multiple Elohim supports henotheism uh, or polytheism uh, because those terms again are modern, and they they were coined by people who assign attribute significance to the term Elohim. I do not. Uh, so I don't I don't think they they apply at all. What I would here's how I would describe it: uh, an Israelite, a biblical writer, anyway, an, a, you know, a, a, an Orthodox Yahweh worshiper mm-hmm. would say that that there are many Elohim because that's what the Hebrew Bible says. There are many Elohim, but among those Elohim, Yahweh is unique. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. And you say, well, what what differentiates Yahweh? What what makes him species unique, so to speak? And in the in the Hebrew Bible, there are things like uh, he is the only one that's described as the creator of all things visible and invisible. He's the only one who is described as sovereign. Again, you you just have you have think he's the only one described as pre-existence before me. There was no other, you know, that kind of thing. So that there are there are four or five ways that an Israelite, a biblical writer would talk about Yahweh, that particular Elohim, uh, that make his that, that telegraph the idea that I I think that this Elohim is 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 unique among all other Elohim. Uh, so that's that's how I would describe that. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks for answering my question. Sure. Are you good, Rex? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's pretty much all I can think of right now off the top of my head. All right. All right. Well, um, I'll go ahead and put you on mute and stay to you, man. You got anything else? Um, you know, just just hit me up. I'll bring you back in. All right. I sure will. Thank you. All right, brother. All right. We have a caller from uh, Georgia on the line. You there? Yeah. Hey, hey, Derek. Hey, what's up, man? It's Devin. Not, not, hey, what's going on, Devin? Not, not, not much, man. Um, uh, co- couple of questions, Derek, Derek. This is for you. Uh, after. After the show, could you um call call me uh yeah could you sure could you call me, could you call me after the show I want sure. I want to ask okay um 
Hi, hi, sir. Hi, sir. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to, I'm listening in too. But I, I, I did, I did have a question about mm-hmm. uh, the the second coming of Christ. Uh, I, I've been, I've been, do, I've been doing a lot of uh, research, and um, you know, I, I looked into uh, UFOlogy and things. And I, I even I even took some notes and I was I was I was watching this thing how how somebody used bi- bibli- biblical text and 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 logic. He he wasn't he wasn't an atheist but he was he was one of those um I guess you could call I guess you could say uh African um Christians I, I guess I guess pan a, pan African I, I don't know, <laughs> but um Afro Afrocentric. Yeah 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 yeah. There you go. Um, he he, I I I don't I don't remember all the I don't remember all the notes I wrote down, but I do remember Matthew twenty four, when uh when he when he was saying that uh when he, when he was saying that Jesus um. Said that many many uh, will 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 go around saying that I am Christ and de- and de- and deceive many, right? So mm-hmm. so uh, so what so what was elaborated to me was that um, you know pe- people will go around saying that Jesus is the Christ when when it when it was saying that he di- he didn't say that. He he was he was he was saying that he was the the son of man. Right. Well, son of, son of man right. uh, is an old is an Old Testament term. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, in most places in the Old Testament, and also in most places in the New Testament, right. the term means human. Okay. Right. Like for for instance, Ezekiel is called the son of man a lot in in the book of Ezekiel, and we know Ezekiel was just a human being. Uh-huh. However, in Daniel chapter seven, there is a, a really important uh, reference to the son of man in that chapter, and that's the scene where we have you know Daniel describes a, a vision he sees. He's you know in in heaven, and he sees the ancient of days sitting on his throne. Uh, and he's in a, he's he's sitting there with the council. Okay, it's a divine council scene, and we know that that it's a divine council scene not only because the word you know council is used, congregation, court, that kind of thing, but also because there are plural thrones. Okay, so it's it's like a boardroom meeting, divine boardroom meeting, and the ancient of days, which is God, is described with the white hair, the whole bit, is there, and he sees Daniel sees one like a son of man coming upon the clouds to the Ancient of Days. Now, the, the, the interesting thing here is that that description, the one who comes upon the clouds or the cloud rider who rides on the clouds, that kind of thing, is actually a, a rare phrase in the Old Testament. It's only used four or five times. It was a title, a known title in the wider ancient Near Eastern world, specifically of Baal. And Baal was a deity. So what's going on here is that the biblical writer uses a familiar title of deity. So he's not an angel. He's not sort of one of these intermediate beings, not, you know, not nothing like that. This is a, a deity title. The biblical writer uses it four times of Yahweh in the Old Testament, refers to Yahweh as the one who rides the clouds the master of the heavens. It, you know, in, in biblical theology, it's not Baal, it's Yahweh, so that makes sense. The only time it's not is that passage in Daniel 7. So you have a deity title used of a second person besides the God of Israel because they're both in the same scene. Now this passage is the passage Jesus quotes when he is on trial in front of Caiaphas, the high priest. Right. When right. Caiaphas says, you know, quit fooling around with us. Tell us who you are. And Jesus says, hereafter, 
you will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds with great glory, and so on and so forth. He quotes Daniel 7. Basically, he's saying, look, I'm the, I'm the Son of Man that's in that chapter. And, it, and we know that that is what Jesus was saying because of what Caiaphas does right after he says it. He tears his clothes, which was a sign of, the, you know, the, of somebody's committed blasphemy. And he says, this is blasphemy. We have no more need of witnesses. You know, get rid of this guy and go kill him. He knew that Jesus, through the title, one who rides on the clouds, who is the Son of Man, he was claiming to be deity. Now, let's take that back to your question. The fact that Jesus references himself as the Son of Man does not rule out that he is divine, a divine being, does not rule out that he's God incarnate. So if, if whoever you were listening to there is using that as an evidence that Jesus was not the Son of God, just, is just not right. He's just not correct. So that I, I think we need a, it's, it's another good example of where you need an Old Testament context to figure out what in the world right. these guys are saying. Right, right, right. Be, be, because uh, be, be, because like you know a, a lot a lot of a lot of a lot of people a lot of people a lot of people keep uh, they keep talking about uh, like. The, the 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 rapture and mm-hmm. that, and that, and that, and everything and it's and it's 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 kind of it's kind of dis- deceiving you know what I mean I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not saying I don't believe it I just I just believe it in a different way you know what I mean because it, it, like, so, something be some you basically uh, here's what I think you're saying. I think you're saying you believe in a second coming but not a rapture. Well, well, I well, well, I I'm not I'm not I'm not saying I don't I don't believe in the rapture. I'm saying I I don't believe it the way ho- Hollywood would portray it at, um in, in Christian movies. Like like this like this big thunderstorm and <laughs> every, and people um, and 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 God is striking us down, trying to take us up and things. And, and, and I, I'm like, well, I look at the rapture a little bit differently because um, the 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 Bible says that you know people people have to die in order to uh, as, as sin. Oh, as far as as far as. Uh... Being glorified and joining joining the yeah. Lord in heaven. Thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I I I follow what you're saying. I I, oh. I understand what I understand how you're looking at it. Uh, okay, okay, okay. T- thank you. Well, hey Devin, thanks for the call, man. And uh, as soon as the show's over, I'll I'll definitely give you a call. All right. Um, we got another call, but I want to ask you this, Michael. Um, mm-hmm. the the whole you know ufology thing. How did you get involved with ufology? Because we see your name, you know, in mm-hmm. there a lot, and you're actually teaching on biblical principles, biblical text. How does the ufology part get in here? Like, you know, how was you introduced to that that, that field? Was that yeah. just a field that was taking some of the terms and things, and you just happened to be there, or what? Well, there there are a number of of ways I could I could answer that question. I think. Probably the the quickest way to get there is uh, it's something I've always been interested in casually, and mm-hmm. then uh, you know as I as I you know went down the the path vocationally of being a biblical scholar and theologian and all this kind of stuff. The the UFO thing uh, to me is important because people who are into that are are very predisposed. To thinking about big picture questions, and what mm-hmm. I mean by that is, uh, you, you go to a UFO conference and people are are very willing to talk about, uh, is there a God? You know, if okay. there's a God, how do we understand Him? How do we relate to Him? What? Who are we? Who made us? Who put us here? Why are we here? What's our purpose? What's this stuff about the image? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're actually really, really ready to discuss things that are important theologically. 
you know, and I've, 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 you know, this is sort of half serious and half not serious, but I think, I think you'd get into better discussions in a lot of ways with, with people at a UFO conference than you do after church. You know, it just, <laughs> you know, it, because people are just yeah. they're they're there and they're thinking about this stuff, and so that that makes it important to me. And then, you know, once you know, I started sort of commenting on this, and a lot of this has to do with uh, with my novel as well, the, the facade. That sort of, you know, put me on the map in those circles. And once that happened, then, you know, I I felt the need, you know, to address some of this stuff about, well, how look at what people who are into UFO stuff they're 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 just really using that to redefine theism, to redefine Christianity, uh, to redefine the faith, or or to attack it. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I, I felt some obligation, you know, to get involved in, in the discussion mm-hmm. uh, with respect to that, you know, both in terms of if you had X, Y, Z experience, how do you really parse this? I mean, yeah. you, you know, I, I want to give you some, some ways, some things you might want to think about before you conclude that Jesus is an alien. You might want to think about these five or six other things over here. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I sort of view that as, as my role uh, in it, and that's you know, why I think it's important. There's a lot of people as well. This gets, you know, thrown out there as well. And I, I know you've dealt with it. The whole Lucifer thing. Mm-hmm. Is Lucifer a title somewhat like Elohim can be a title? Is Lucifer not the devil? Is not Satan? Who does Isaiah chapter 14 speak about according to your research? Well, if you go to Isaiah 14, you... You know, Lucifer actually is the is an English word created from a Latin word <laughs> mm-hmm. that's used to translate uh, a phrase in Isaiah fourteen twelve, which in Hebrew is uh, Hallel Ben Shakar, the Shining One, the Son of the Dawn. So, Shining One, there you know in Latin is you know gets translated with Lucifer, and that's where we get you know that that term, that name. In that chapter, he's not actually referred to as, you know, Satan. And devil, of course, is not a Hebrew term, so that's sort of off the table. Um, but, you know, I'm of the view, and this is a minority view, that Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 and Genesis 3 are sort of all drawing on the same story. You know, this sort of a story of cosmic rebellion. And so even though you don't have the terms, a uh, specific term you know, for Satan uh, occur in, in these passages, I think you do have a reference to, a, you know, again, a, a cosmic rebellion idea. And so conceptually, you know, I think there, there is good reason you know, to look at these passages together and not separate them. I will mm-hmm. say, though, that Satan in Hebrew uh, in the Old Testament is not a proper name. Uh, it mm-hmm. becomes a proper name in, uh, in the period between the Testaments, the Old and New Testament, and then, of okay. course, in the New Testament it, itself. So that's a... Uh, Satan means you know, adversary. Uh-huh. So, it's, so that's it almost a like a, a title as well, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the Satan. He's not a person. Technically, yeah. Not even, and we see. Not even translated. Yeah, we see Peter as uh, acting as Satan as well, acting as, as, as an a, adversary. A, yeah, as one who had in you know mind the uh, things of man and not the things of God. Well, the the angel of the Lord uh, acts as God's Satan, God's Satan, in uh, the Book of Numbers twenty two, the the Balaam story. Mm-hmm. He's the angel that that opposes. That's what Satan. What Satan means to to oppose or be in an adversarial stance toward. He opposes, you know, the the donkey impedes his progress. Wants to stop Balaam. So the the term itself is just. It's actually pretty generic, you know, just a some opposition point or person. Mm-hmm. But when it you know when it when it gets set in opposition to God. You, know, you have yeah. this sort of sense of cosmic rebellion. Mm-hmm. Well, we got another caller. 
Um, sure. I don't want to forget about them. Uh, caller in Texas, are you there? Oh, is that me? Yes, that is you, Texas. Oh, okay. <laughs> are you How's it going? Texas? I have my. I see myself twice in here. I didn't know I was Texas. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How's it going? Oh uh, well, I. I'm good. I'm good. My name's Anna. Um, here. Um, Hello. Um, well, I mean, what y'all were talking about earlier are two questions that I had um, already written down. Um, you know, the one about Genesis 1, 26 and 27, uh, God referring, you know, to us and who us was referring to. That's one of the questions that I had. So y'all talked what, about what that. Was, and, what was the first one? Um, work in Genesis one twenty six and twenty seven verses twenty six okay. and twenty seven. Yeah, yeah. So you already went. Oh, y'all went over oh. that. So I, I, I just wanted to get. Um, I guess I'll look more in the website as to the documents that you have, and I look those over to get more information. I guess about it. Um, yeah, well, I guess. So. Up, I was gonna say if you go to the, to the website. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, drmsh.com. There, I, I have three blogs. Okay, the, the the third blog, the one I haven't mentioned yet tonight, is is UFO religions. So if you click on that at the top of my homepage, drmsh.com, and then click on UFO religions, two or three, I think it's two or three, maybe four, posts ago, I actually put a uh, uh, a handout like a, a PDF file of a pretty lengthy article that I wrote on the image of God. And in that, there's a little bit of a discussion of the plurality. So if, if you got that document, that might help you as well. Okay. <clears throat> yes, I have both pulled up, so I'll, I'll get those and look more into it. Good. And, I get, and that other question was about also on Psalm 82. Um, I had a pastor before that um, basically, I think, taught about that verse. But he was saying more about, like, we ourselves are are gods. Mm -hmm. Well, my my wife could testify that I am not a deity. (laughs) (laughs) I'll start off by saying that. I will will disown my own divinity there uh, in that sense because... She would certainly help me with that. Uh, but that's a common view, that the Elohim there are human beings. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the problem, of course, that you have is if you go over to, if you read Psalm 82, you know, the talk about, you know, the council of El, the council of the mighty, and so on and so forth, the sons of God, the most high, and all this kind of stuff. If you take that and you go over to Psalm 89, You'll notice right away in the first five, six, seven verses that the descriptions are the same with one significant difference. Psalm 89 very clearly has the council in the heavens, okay, in the clouds. So the, the council idea clearly refers to a spiritual, a heavenly council that, that does not concern humans. The other problem with that is I would ask you know whoever said that to you, at what point in Old Testament history, in Old Testament theology, do the Israelites, do the Jewish elders, any human being, at what point do they have control of all the nations so that God would rebuke them the way he rebukes the sons of the Most High in Psalm 82, for being corrupt in their administration over the nations? The Jews, the Israelites, never had jurisdiction over all the nations of the world. It just, it's a view that's common, but frankly, it it just doesn't work, you know, when you you start thinking about it closely and looking at other passages. So let me ask you this, too. Um, I'm under the assumption that the us spoken of in Genesis 1, the us spoken of uh, at the scripture of the uh, Tower of Babel, and the is I, I'm actually under the assumption that that's not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, obviously. And then we get to Genesis chapter 18, where the Lord appeared, capital L O R D, appeared with um, 
three men beside him. As far as context is concerned, this us that was coming down, this us, let us come down, let us do this, let us do this. And then we see in Genesis chapter 18 that these us came down. Am I right to assume that? Well, in in, uh, in Genesis 18, and you don't you don't really have uh, any any sort of specific description as to you know where they came from or you know coming mm-hmm. down or anything like that. This, that's a good assumption because we find out you know in the story mm-hmm. that one of them is is Yahweh and the other two are of course not human. So yeah, I mean. Again, my my view of this is going to sound really kind of dumb, but my view of this is pretty <laughs> simple. <laughs> Come on now. That is, you have you have uh, you have God and you have a, a heavenly host, you know, a whole bunch of divine beings, and occasionally some mm-hmm. of them come along. You know, you don't. In other words, yeah. I'm not locked into this triune language, and I think your I think your thought is is really good there. You, the use of that passage, you know, would certainly suggest that, you know, th- this is sort of normative, you know, for, for biblical language and, and the biblical worldview. Mm-hmm. So that capital L-O-R-D there, that, um, if I pull it up, that translates to Yahovah. That's the same as Yahweh? or Well, in, 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 English, in English Bibles, the way you can tell... Uh, this is the, the the publishing convention, printing typeface convention, is if L-O-R-D is in all caps, you know, mm-hmm. like small caps, all caps, that represents the divine name, you know, Y-H-W-H. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the only time that, that you'll see a departure from this is when you have the phrase Lord God, and then God is in all caps, and what that is is it, is it's the combined divine name. It's it's Yahweh Elohim. So mm-hmm. you, 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 but that doesn't occur that often. So most of the time, whenever you see the all caps with the Lord, that is Yahweh. If you don't see all caps, like let's just say it's a capital L, and then the O R D is in lower case, then it's the word the Hebrew word Adonai, uh, which is a different term, which may or may not be used of God. Uh, You just have to tell by the context. Okay. Um, I I guess another question, um, I guess to go along with that. Well, hold on. Someone someone has a question in the chat they want me to ask you. This is kind of left field. Dr. Heiser, what are your thoughts on spiritual evolution, awakening? How do you reach God with your beliefs? Obviously, the religious system is bad. Well, I... I don't know that I'd, I'd have to know what you mean by the religious system to know whether I'd call it bad or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would certainly call it... Uh, flawed? Anywhere from, anywhere from incomplete to flawed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, there'd be a, a wide range of terms I think I would use there, but I think that, that Hebrews 11 here is, is a pull, you know, where you know we read that without faith it is impossible to please him, and he did comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So, mm-hmm. the whole idea of, of development, the sort of being drawn, you know, along in, in terms of, you know, a spiritual journey, that kind of thing. I think, uh, you know, Scripture does teach, at, at least if you're moving, you know, in, in, in the right direction, that, you know, God does draw people behind a process, he's behind the relationships that we have to, to move us down the road, and all that sort of thing. That's, that's a long way of saying, yeah, I think God is active rather than passive uh, in, in these sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Okay, another question that I personally have. Um, we see this, this entity, this being, this angel, this God uh, appearing throughout the scripture on several occasions. And it's a title being used who pops up to do a certain thing. The title, the angel of the Lord. Is this a separate entity? This angel of the Lord that's that's called this every time. Yeah, this is a this is a, a really complex question. There are times when the angel of the Lord, the Malak Adonai, the Malak Yahweh, 
is distinguished from Yahweh, and there are other times when he is identified with Yahweh, sort of fused with Yahweh. So you actually see both. Uh, I, I, this, I, so this is actually part of my dissertation, whole issue. I think that our concept, the, the Christian concept of a Godhead, uh, you know, we, we, we use the word Trinitarian, but even taking a step back from that, even a binitarian, you have know, two persons. I think that whole concept is part of Old Testament theology. I think that the, that the best way to illustrate fusion of the two is in Genesis 48, where uh, Jacob is blessing his children, and you know, he's about ready to die, and he's blessing the sons of Joseph, and he says, in his blessing, may the God who you know preserved my life and all my life long, you know, may the God who did this, that, and the other thing for me, he is Elohim twice. And then the third line is, may the angel who has, again, preserved me bless these boys. And the verb there, bless, is singular. It's not plural. So basically you have two different entities, God and this angel, and a singular verb which translates may he bless these boys. And it they're, they're just virtually indistinguishable, that passage, because the writer could have used a plural to distinguish them, but he doesn't. So you have sort of this fusion going on. So I actually think the angel of the Lord is the visible Yahweh uh, in the Old Testament, that he is... I have this crazy view of, of there being two Yahwehs in the Old Testament. One is visible, the other is visible, and I think that forerunner of Godhead thinking in the New Testament. It's, it's mm -hmm. the backdrop to how a Jew could embrace the worship of the God of Israel to also worship Jesus, not think he was doing anything wrong, uh, because Jesus is the visible manifestation of God the Father. And I think we have that Old Testament system. We have that system described in the Old Testament, an invisible and a visible Yahweh, and the two are the same, but yet they're different, kind of the way we talk about Jesus. You know, Jesus is God, but he's not the Father, but he's still God in the sense that God is, and all this language we use, you can say the same thing in the Old Testament in different passages. Mm -hmm. but yeah, because we see him... Um... It's, it's just so... If, if there's ever a, an opportunity for a, for the biblical writer to say, "Hey, I don't want anybody to be confused. I want you, to, I want you to completely separate these two. That's the passage where he could have done it, but he does the opposite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we see that term used a lot, um, and you know we hear it um, a lot. Um, as far as dealing with the different types of angels and the different type of, of, of gods and things like that, in your studies, who who have you seen the watchers to be? What it, what you know? What are their roles? Well, watcher is uh, is primarily a second term that's used in you know the Book of Enoch and some other books for you know in place of the God again just divine beings. I mean, it, it, it's used in Daniel, too, in, uh, mm -hmm. in parallel to the word holy one. Well, I take watcher to be a sort of a descriptive term. It, it refers to a divine being, but it, it's a word that sort of gives you a little glimpse into you know, what what they do or, or what, what an attribute is. You know, it, it literally means the one who watches, in other words, who doesn't sleep. You know that this is ever watchful, always you know looking at what's, what's going on and that sort of thing. So, uh, but the way it, it's used in Jewish literature, predominantly outside of Daniel, it's referring mm -hmm. to uh, referring to the Genesis six episode. Okay, the Genesis six, and also mentioned in um, Enoch, which is, is most likely a a detailed look at Genesis 6 and some other things and actually talking about the watchers 
uh, being a type of angel who uh, watches and records everything and reports it back to the Most High? Is that a accurate statement? Yeah. yeah in, in, in academic terminology, Enoch is put in the genre known as the rewritten Bible. Mm-hmm. What that means is basically it's an amplified version. You know, there's a biblical story, then lots of details get added to it. If anybody's read Enoch, you know, that's exactly what it is. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that that is the way the, the, the terminology is used there, not not only in Enoch. I mean, there are other there are other texts, Jubilees, and things like that, where you have uh, the term watcher used. But biblically, it's biblical use. It's clearly referring to a divine being, you know, someone from, from the heavens. Uh huh. All right, we have another caller. I'll go ahead and take this call. This is uh ancient lady. How you doing? Hey, pretty good. We got a question? Yes, this is Connie from uh, Into the Light. Hey, how are you? Hey, pretty good. Hey, Dr. Heiser, I just had a couple questions for you. Sure. Um, for one, I know Rex had said that he had. Um, asked a couple things, but my computer crashed right then, so I didn't hear anything. Um, for one, I wanted, just wanted to know, like, just your personal outlook, um, based on all of your study that you've done on all the ancient Hebrew belief systems, um, are you, does that kind of change how you look at what we term, like, modern Christianity, you know, being, everybody being Trinitarian, and, you know, I know you said that you kind of ruffle a few feathers there sometimes, and with some of the things that you speak out about. But, uh, like, are you, does that kind of change your worldview? Like, are you a geocentrist now? Are you an uh, Are you a Trinitarian? I would, I, would, I would still hold to Trinitarian uh, theology. I get there in, through quite a different path. <laughs> you know, and, uh, it's typical, which, which bugs some people. But I... Again, I, I can't really divorce this from the Old Testament. The Old Testament, it's very easy to demonstrate a two-person Godhead. And once you do that, then you begin to notice that some of the terminology used for the second person is also used in a few passages of the Spirit. And it, in at least one instance, in 63, uh, and you have to take that in parallel to parallel in Psalm 78. And one is all three of them actually in the same scene as it were. So what I think happens is the, the New Testament writers use that language, use that idea when they talk about Jesus, because there are four or five places where Jesus is called the Spirit. You know, the Lord who is the Spirit, that sort of language. So just as just as the angel of the Lord is but isn't Yahweh, and just as Jesus is but isn't God, the Spirit is but isn't Jesus. I mean, you have this this sort of two-ness going on, and then, then you bring a third one in there, and, and, you, and you come out Trinitarian. So I, I, I think it's consistent across the Testaments that the New Testament writers are thinking in very Old Testament terms, and, and this idea that, that you can have a deity who is more than one person can be simultaneously present at different locations, that is not unique to the Hebrew Bible. I mean, that, you're, you're going to find that uh, in other uh, religious texts. So that, that's not some aberration or something that the, the Israelites are making up. What's unique about them is that they're going to isolate the language to Yahweh. Uh, he is the only one who can be spoken of this way. And so, again, I... I don't have any, any tension in that respect with being Trinitarian, but if I walk into a church and start talking about this sort of stuff, how I get there, it, it, yeah, it's going to freak people out. Uh, <laughs> but, hey, you know, that's that's what it is. Right. And what about the other ones, like uh, geocentrists? Because I actually just sent... Um, I'm not in a church anymore. I go to a home church. Um, right. My pastor actually got kicked out for his beliefs, for his 9-11 beliefs. Um, okay. And so he decided to, well, the Lord actually decided that he was going to start a home church. So um, he's all about truth and wanting to get, you know, stuff out there about the Bible and obviously about what's really going on in the world and everything. So that being said, I 
have really researched a lot myself. So I was like, okay, let me go ahead and bring you up and bring up all these other things. And one of it was um, the cosmology too, the Hebrew cosmology. And so I ended up, you know, giving your, um, I can't remember which one it was, but it was some lecture that you did. It was found it on YouTube, and I ended up sending it out to the, the other church members and um, just trying to get their take on what they thought. <laughs> and um, so it was kind of interesting to hear what they had to say about that. But um, what's your personal view I'm about that? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't hold to a geocentric universe. I, I don't think that that uh, it's the intent of Genesis to teach us, uh, you know, science in terms of well, we're going to learn physics from Genesis. We're going to learn astrophysics from Genesis. I don't. I don't think that at all. I think it's it's their way. It's a very typical ancient Near Eastern cosmology uh, that sort of it's a theological statement. You know, it. it the language that's used, you can find in uh, ancient Mesopotamian texts. You can find a little bit in Egyptian texts. You can find a little bit in Canaanite texts. Right. And the reason for that is that the biblical writer is taking all these ideas into Genesis and then turning them around to sort of slap the other gods around because he's, he's going to be inserting Yahweh into the text in conjunction with all those ideas to make a theological statement. You know, it's, it's, it's Yahweh who created this, you know, this, okay, this world yeah, as we know it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so I think it's about theological messaging. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's about uh, articulating any sort of scientific theory. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm a creationist in that sense. I certainly believe in a creator. We, we have to affirm that. Right, so I, right. I would be a, I'd be a dualist terms of creation, a firm distinction between a creator and the rest of creation, but I'm not a geocentrist. So what about Enoch? Oh, Derek asked cool about that me. earlier. Oh, okay. Um, oh. Derek, should, should I answer that? Or well, that's fine. I mean, I mean, we're coming, we're coming on, on at the, at the uh, end of the show, and um, but yeah, ancient lady. Hey, thanks for calling, and uh, definitely stay up with us on Facebook and everything. I appreciate you pushing the show as well. We're coming up on the end of the show, and just really wanted to see, you know, final thoughts. If you had anything to say, we'll definitely give out your website and everything. And I totally appreciate you coming on the show. And so much information was given tonight, and definitely want to have you back on because we didn't even really touch the sitch and stuff or, you know, a lot of other stuff we can get into, man, but we really did cover a lot with the uh, divine counsel of the Elohim and anybody who's a beginner, I think you covered it and, and nailed it on the head. And I think a lot of more, a lot of questions are going to rise up. And if anybody has any questions, you could definitely get uh, Dr. Heiser's email address from his website and you can contact him through his website. You go to Michael Heiser dot com michael h e e i s e r dot com and um i guess with these last few moments if there's anything that you had to say that you wanted to reiterate on you know before we end it uh, i guess now's the chance I, the, the 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 home page is actually michael s heiser but since you can't spell my name my last name i i got a redirect and they could use a www dot d r as in doctor the abbreviation d r sh.com and it'll take you to that page i think for our subject tonight divine council stuff go to my home page drmsh.com there's a link on the left hand side there's a link at the top that says divine council and you'll be taken directly to my page devoted to that subject and you'll find a lot of stuff there i think we'll go a long way to answering questions probably raising other questions too yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, it's kind of an introductory. Like I said, there's so many more questions that come on, uh, things, especially with the sitch and stuff, because you tackle a lot of half-truths there. And we definitely want to get into that. I mean, I watched your whole series with the uh, sitch and is wrong stuff, and I've showed a lot of people some really interesting stuff there. Um, you know, a lot of people definitely admire Sitchin's work, and... I wouldn't, you know, denounce it all, but there's definitely some things that he is wrong on, and you address that with the website uh, sitchinishwrong.com. Yeah, and if, if people want to go to, uh, if they want to watch, there's a, a three-hour video on YouTube uh, called Ancient Aliens Debunked. Uh, I'm in that uh, in different 
parts of it, but it's a really good uh, documentary as far as the claims of the ancient astronaut uh, theory that those ideas I think is, is really well worth watching. It's got over a million and a half views already. It's only been out since September. I would encourage people who are interested in that subject to watch the documentary. It's free. Hours of it. Totally. Well, like I said, you know, it's a, a blessing to have you on the show. And uh, we're definitely going to have this show archived on YouTube. You can go there and check it out and check out some of the past shows that we had. Some amazing stuff on there. Um, next week, we're going to be talking to uh, Gemini of the group Conspirituality, talking about conspiracy uh, conspiracy facts, uh, the difference between conspiracy theory and conspiracy fact, truth movement, and with 9-11 truth actually in Canada. So we're going to be speaking with him next week. So thanks for calling, Dr. Heiser, and I definitely want to have you back on. We're going to have to schedule something else. I appreciate you coming. Well, I, I appreciate it. Just let me know. All right, brother. Thanks so much. And with that being said, man, I definitely want to thank all of the callers, everybody participating in the chat room. Um, it's you know, it's an honor, it's a blessing that you guys tune in, and we just got a platform here for everybody to ask their questions to their you know favorite researchers, and we feature guests um, every week. Some of them have different belief systems. Some of them specialize on different topics. We're going to be speaking with Jim and I next week. Uh, after that, we're going to be speaking to John Illuminati Congo. We're going to be talking about sacred breathing. It's going to be an amazing show because he is a, a deep individual. Who, I mean, you can just be lulled asleep by listening to him because all the information, I mean, it's it's amazing. And then after that, we're going to be speaking with Jordan Maxwell. And um, I know nobody's a uh, you know stranger to uh, his name. And if you got questions for these guys or if you have input you want to share, Definitely contact me and, uh, you know, contact us on the show. Send me an email. Send me a comment on the video if you have anybody you think that we should interview, any topics you want us to cover, and we're definitely going to do it. This is a show for you guys to call in, and it's a platform for you. It wouldn't, it wouldn't you know, exist without you guys. So thanks so much for tuning in. Peace and blessings to um, everyone listening. Thanks so much again from the bottom of my heart. Shalom. Peace. If you would like to sponsor the show or advertise on the Mythicist podcast, you can do so by going to www.mythicist.me and click on Sponsor the Show for more info. If you would like to support the show financially, you can do that also by going to mythicist.me and become a monthly supporter. We appreciate your monthly support. 